Hello everyone, I am sending you the notes. Uh, now in the eight o'clock section, we worked through these notes. We I left early from the 930 section. So this is mainly for the 930, but I'm gonna send it to both classes um, so that you have that to look over. I'm also going to send the note guide so you can see what that looks like and you can go back and look at your notes and uh, fill in if you choose to, uh, however you choose to do it. So what does canon mean? Canon is, the word canon is a Greek term, canon, uh, and it was originally a reed, the name of a reed or a measuring stick. Um, the meter we have, they had a, a reed that was one meter long that they would use as a standard and different villages would copy that reed for that standard measurement. Um, and so the word canon um, means standard. Now, I asked um, in the first class, I told this story, but this is, does anybody know who this is? This is Pablo Hildalgo. I lived in Northern California, north of Golden Gate Bridge. I went up to Petaluma um, and went to a bookstore and they said, there's gonna be a lecture by Pablo Hildaldo. Uh, and what he is, he was an author who wrote books about Star Wars. He was hired by Disney. When Disney bought the Star Wars franchise, he was hired and he is on a committee and they are the ones that determine if it is real Star Wars. Now, when George Lucas owned Star Wars, he allowed fans to write books and come up with merchandise and different things that were official Star Wars products. When Disney bought it, they said, we need to control what is Star Wars? And the, probably the truth is so they could make money off of it. But they began to declare this is legal Star Wars. These movies are the movies that count and anything else that's made is not. So they established, this committee established the canon for Star Wars. That term, as I said, means standard. And the Bible is the biblical canon is the standard for Christian faith and practice. Faith is what we believe, what we hold in our heart, and practice is what we do as a product of that faith. Now, we, we've discussed it at times, we may have mentioned it, but it is through faith that we connect with God. According to the Bible, we do not connect to God by religious practice, by the things that we do. It is only by what we believe in our heart. Um, the example would be in a marriage, uh, the love you have in a marriage would be like faith. If you truly love your spouse, that's what faith is. That is the true connection. Practice is what we do. And we know that you could pretend to love somebody and not really love them. And sooner or later, that'll catch up with you in a human relationship. But the Bible tells us that if you fake faith and you are just doing the practice, that God knows what is in our heart and we don't have a true relationship with him. So the Bible canon is the standard for what we believe in our heart about God. And it is also the standard for telling us how we practice that faith. Council of Jamnia. Um, there was, there is a town in Israel today called Yavne. It is right there in in the first century A.D. 200 uh, A.D. began 2,024 uh, years ago. Uh, in they called it Jamnia at that. It's on the coast there, and there were a bunch of rabbis. Rabbis are religious teachers in Judaism, the the ancient Israelite Hebrew people. Uh, I believe that rabbi is an Aramaic word for teacher. Uh, Jesus was considered a rabbi. Usually they have followers that follow them around and listen to them talk about things and learn things over, over years. Anyway, at Jamnia, there was a bunch of rabbis that would meet each day and discuss the, the, the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament. They would say the Torah, the writings, the prophets, and they would discuss them and how they affected life. Now, someone wrote down during one of these, you would almost call them impromptu meetings. It wasn't really a council. It, we call it a council, but it's not really a council. 
one of these impromptu meetings, someone wrote down a list of the 39 books that were included in the canon of the Old Testament. And that excluded, there were many other books that people were aware of that were written at that time that were excluded. So that is the oldest record we have. Um, it is around 100 AD. So ostensibly Jesus was born around zero. Everything before zero was BC. Everything after Jesus is AD. So about 100 years after Jesus's birth, these, these rabbis wrote someone one of these rabbis wrote down the 39 Old Testament books. So that's the oldest record of the Old Testament canon that we have written down in one place. And so Christianity accepted the Hebrew canon. Hebrew is another word for Israelite. Uh, uh, Jew is a contraction. That is the survival. That's the tribe of Judah. A contraction of that word Judah is Jew. Um, the Israelite, Hebrew, Jewish biblical canon, they decided the 39 books, and Christianity has just accepted that. that. Christianity did not vote on what the books were. They accepted the the Hebrew canon. So we get the Old Testament from the Hebrews, Israelites. So canonicity, there are, there are certain criteria. These are just the things that the the criteria that scripture must meet in order to be considered part of the Bible. First, uh, it needed to be spoken by a prophet. That was somebody that God spoke directly to or a spirit led person. Now that who is a prophet and who is a spirit led person? Well, that is determined by the community of faith. In the case of the Old Testament, that would be the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people. Uh, determined that these scriptures, the 39 books, were spoken by a prophet or a spirit-led person. When I say spirit-led, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit speaking to people um, in a direct revelation that they wrote down in the Bible. Now, the second criteria is that the books to be included in the canon of scripture, the 39 books, needed to be for all generations not just for a specific, they're not like a letter written to a specific group of Israelites uh, addressing a sp specific issue at a specific time and saying things that did not really apply to other people. The, the, to be included in the Bible canon, the books need to speak to issues that people of faith will deal with for all generations. The third criteria is that it needs to be consistent with what has already been written. So the first part, the first section of the, the Old Testament is the Pentateuch, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so if those were written, and then the next couple books, Joshua, Judges, said something completely different, that would be inconsistent. So in order for later books to be included in the 39 books of the biblical canon, they had to be consistent and say the same things that had already been said. Now, there's two other things that are very important parts of canonicity. The first one is that canonicity for these books to be considered, should they be in the Bible or not, they have to be intermingled with a religious community. We would say now a church uh, in the ancient uh, Hebrew religion, an assembly of the community. Uh, these books would have to be read. These books would have to be thought about, memorized, studied. Uh, religious practice would be done in this religious community. And it had to be done over time. None of these were, okay, you know, Johnny over here is a prophet and he wrote a, a scripture book. Let's go ahead and include it. No, uh, if Johnny wanted to get in the Bible, he had, his book had to be read for centuries. You know, by the time of the complete canon, parts of the Bible had been around 15, 1,500 years. Um, and so it is, in order, uh, something has to be spoken by a prophet 
for all generations consistent with what has previously been included. It has to be embraced and read and studied and thought about by a religious community over a long period of time. So canonicity is not a simple thing or a fast thing. Canonicity is something that happens over sometimes thousands of years. Talking about inspiration, talking about how the Bible was, was written. What do we mean by inspiration? Well, let's turn to scripture. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, writing a letter to Timothy. It's included in the New Testament. This is the second letter we have, so 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And, and Paul wrote this to that young preacher. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, what Paul was talking about was not New Testament. He was When he said scripture in the New Testament, he was talking about the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament is given by inspiration of God. Now, in that word, uh, you see spire in there. We get the word spiritual. It is from the Latin word spiros, which means breathe. So in the Greek that the letter was originally written in, the, it said all scripture is God breathe, is by the breath of God. God is inspiring or in breathing the scripture into people. Uh, he's, we mean that God speaks to human authors and they write down what God speaks to them and it becomes scripture. They use their writing ability, they use their vocabulary, um, they use their skill in hearing what God says to communicate it as we would if we, um, it would be similar to what we would do if we wrote a paper. Uh, but they would be hearing from God and communicating what they heard from God to mankind. So it says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God as God breathed and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is what we believe. Uh, that's what we, the basis of our faith. So, uh, this God breathed scripture is profitable for us understanding what we believe, also for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work, which is our practice, our religious practice. So remember, the Bible is the standard for faith and practice. We get what we believe from the Bible and what we do with it, how we practice it from the Bible. That is inspiration. The Bible is inspired by God for instruction in faith and practice. Let me say that again. The Bible is inspired by God for instruction in faith and practice. So I do have a, a slide here. Let me go ahead and give this slide since I've got it up. This is about textual transmission for Bible formation. And so what this is doing is to just give you a real quick snapshot of the process of getting the Bible that we have. So uh, we think timing gets murkier and murkier the more we look back in history. You go back 100 years, things start to get murky. You go back a thousand years, they get really murky. You go back, uh, this would be uh, 3,800 years ago to get back to 1800 BC. Things are really, you know, hard to get the clues and, and to get a clear picture of. But the best we can tell, Abraham, the first Hebrew, lived about 1800 BC. About 300 years later, after the children of Israel had gone into slavery in Egypt. They had gone down to Egypt and been enslaved. Say the children of Israel, again, that's another word for the Hebrew, or we would call them Jewish people today. Moses was born into this slavery at a time where the, the Pharaoh was beginning to fear the Israelites and beginning to kill the oldest son for each family. So he was but Moses was taken into the household of the Egyptian Pharaoh and he was taught to write. And so we think about 1500 BC, Moses began to write the Pentateuch. And while they were in the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, he began to form this 
the first, the second section in our course. Uh, we call it the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Now, over the next, you see from 1500 BC to 400 BC, the Old Testament is being written. It's being formed within that Israelite religious community. They are reading these scriptures. They are praying to God using these scriptures. They are developing rules for living based on the laws given in the scripture. They are doing faith and practice. They are forming the canon over that time. The last book of the Old Testament was written around 400 BC. Now it wasn't instantly canonized. I'm going to show you in a minute this kind of the steps of the canonization. So it was even making it, forming it, forming it into a text. Then it begins to solidify and not change. Then it is accepted as the canon. So about 400 BC, as best we can tell, the Torah, the first five books, I've called it the Pentateuch. Uh, the Torah is canonized. At that point, it cannot be altered or changed. And we have a very good snapshot uh, in, in the Bible. We have that canonized Torah. Uh, we have a good idea what it looked like. Um, it was called the Forlaga. Now, this is a very interesting thing. That's a German word, and, and the V sound in German is uh, is an F, pronounced as an F. So forlaga, forlaga means something like the front page or the, the top page or something. That Torah that was canonized was called the forlaga. The forlaga was then copied. It was in Hebrew and it was copied in Hebrew. And then about 200 years later, uh, it was copied into Greek. Now this LXX, that is the word for 70, the Roman symbol for 70, the number 70. Um, and that is because tradition says that in 70, um, in 200 BC, 70 scholars met for 70 days in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, and began translating the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, into Greek. It took them 70 days. Now what they were copying was the forlaga. Um, and it was about this time, about 200 BC, that the prophets was canonized. It was called the Navim in, in Hebrew. From Navi, the word Navi in Hebrew is prophet. The Navim was the prophets. It became canonized, solidified. So it's kind of simultaneously with it being translated into Greek. Now, now the New Testament is written in Greek. And so this, now we have... Today, when I look at the Hebrew Bible, I am looking at a Hebrew version of that forlaga. We could call that a tradition. And then this is the Greek tradition, is the LXX. Uh, there has always been a charge that because the New Testament is in Greek, that the Greek Old Testament has been heavily influenced by Christianity. You see, the, it's called the Septuagint, the Greek version. The Greek Septuagint is considered to be much more messianic, talking about the Messiah, who is Jesus. And so there was always the charge in scholarship that, Christ, that the Old Testament had been Christianized in the Septuagint. Um, the, the process goes on to about 100 AD, talking about the Council of, of Gemnia. About that time, what's called the writings, the Ketuvim, was canonized. Um, and we had a completed Bible. So if you're taking notes there, that is after the birth of Jesus, before we had a solid canon of the whole Old Testament. Now, here's the interesting thing. There had always been that for, for about 2,000 years, there was a charge made on occasion that Christians had inserted the Messiah into the Greek version. And then in 1947, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls and we found not the forlaga, but a Hebrew version that reflected that forlaga um, that wasn't the same as the Hebrew Bible we have today. And what we discovered was, in fact, that the, 
the level of Messiah talk in the Greek version reflected that forelaga. And that in effect, the Hebrew version, which had been copied after the birth of Jesus, um, had nudged the scriptures to look less messianic. That the more messianic version of the Greek was closer, most likely, to the forelaga that came before. Anyway, ask me questions about that in class. I'm going to stop the notes there. Hope, hopefully that was helpful. We'll pick up our notes in point one one at this point on Thursday. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.